Manuel Barueco. I have to say that I remember driving around Baltimore one time, and he was 21, and he said, you know, I'm going to be the greatest in the world. No one's going to be better than me. And uh, so he knew what he had. And there was already a buzz, you could feel it. At that time, there was one guitarist on the planet who was playing at a level of cleanliness and, and uh, perfection uh, that was unbelievable, and that was John Williams. And Manuel was already approaching that level. I can say that Manuel, it's, it's one point that it's after Manuel and before Manuel Barreto. Things just started to gather momentum, so it didn't take very long for him to start uh, becoming a recitalist and becoming a professional. And as I remember, that first recording started with Etude 7 and Villalobos, which kind of blew a lot of people's minds. second recording with Albenis and Granados went quite a bit further uh, musically. Um, I remember John Williams said that was just, you know, an earth-shattering recording, and I, I believe it was. It really turned everybody's heads around. You know, you only need a quarter of a second, or a couple of seconds, and bang, you know it's Manuel. And I think that's an important thing, you know, to have, to have something that's as individual as that, to have a, a thumbprint on your sound. Well, I think Manuel's playing really, um, it, it struck the whole of the guitar world because I think his album where he plays all of the Spanish music was perhaps the first one that, of course, he'd recorded before and he could really play really well, but that one really um, hit us all because it was almost a new way of playing some of the Spanish music and uh, very powerful, apart from technically immaculate. Um, it had so much character and a very strong character and a new character and I think that was an important thing. I mean each of us, each of us soloists, we, we try to have our own character and Manuel found his very young, very early on in his, in his career. His style, uh, I, I would say a very patrician style, a very aristocratic style, a very elegant style, not a style of, of emotional extremes. 
there's a side to Manuel that he doesn't always show, which is a very kind of vulnerable, uh, sensitive side. And um, I think that comes out in his playing. There's a great power to that kind of introversion and that, that sensitivity combined with this unbelievable uh, facility on the instrument, which is almost understated. So when you have that, um, that kind of sensitive side and then this unbelievable guitar playing, it's, it's a very potent combination. When he played the Granadas and when he plays the Albanies, you don't hear the guitar anymore. It's just uh, it's another instrument. It's uh, really incredible. His concentration is so strong that he draws everyone. So it's the, the focus of the concert is right there. It's right in the middle of the stage where he is. Some of Manuel's later recordings that I've listened to, particularly the Spanish ones and his Bach recordings, I think are absolutely superb. He's a complete master, and uh, his interpretation is absolutely secure. His technique, of course, is incredible. Uh, it's, uh, it's hard to imagine anybody can play better than he can. He's actually... Um, in some ways a rather shy person and that sort of retiring quality is often very touching in the music. It's, it's really hard to, to choose between all the different albums Manuel and I made together because I really just love working with him. Whatever he plays, it's always about the music, not about him. So if he's playing Bach, it's about Bach. If he's playing a piece by a Cuban composer, it's about you know, the quality of the Cuban music. There's something very egoless about, about his music making, which I think is very refreshing and something that I always admire. There's a sort of humility about it. And I just fell in love with the guitar. I just thought it was the most beautiful thing, and I asked for lessons. So when I was nine years old, I developed this, this, this uh, great relationship with my teacher, Manuel Push. And I remember the first time I played in public in, in one of the uh, student concerts. And, and, I, and I remember thinking I, I, was, I was walking into another dimension. <laughs> I was so afraid. And it's not afraid of not playing well, because I think when you're a child, that's not what you're afraid of. I was going to be there and everybody was going to be looking at me. And I would not be able to get away from that. <laughs> but, on the, other, on the other hand, there were a lot of rewards that came from that, because I got a lot of compliments. I mean, I, I, I did, you know what I mean? I, and so it was kind of the price to pay. And, and I wonder even to this day in, in why psychologically I do what I do, because I, I don't feel that I do it easily. I think I, I kind of struggle with it. Okay. So here we go. Even before a concert, I go to play a concert, and I keep thinking, why in the world, you know, w w would anybody want to come to listen to this? Afro-Cuban dance by Ernesto de Cuona, uh, named Danza Lucumi. Well, I am originally from, from Santiago de Cuba. Um, so the first rumblings, the first things that I heard about Castro and and, and the revolution must have been when I was about six years old, six or seven. Well, with the revolution there was a, a big change, but it was not until Castro declared himself a communist that our lives would really change forever. I remember the day the, uh, the revolution won the troops of, of Castro, and, and I remember the day that the troops came in, in, into the city, and, we, and I remember from the second, second floor balcony where we lived, looking down and seeing the, these guys in uh, dressing green with long hair and beards and people like Che Guevara and this, 
Um, I just remember a feeling of euphoria. I remember how nice they were, they were to everybody. How they were like angels, you know? That, that's, that's, that's how it felt to me at the time. And then things began to change, you know? The, the, the one threat that seems to be, from that point on in my life, is just a lot of fear. We were living now in a system that, that did not allow a dissent. You couldn't speak against it, you would be punished if you did. And I happened to have a mother that didn't seem to be able to control herself, and I feared for her that something would happen to her. But you know, when you're a child, it's very intense, you know? And, and, and I was very afraid. So how could you live in a place that did not accept what you thought, who you were? Then after a couple of years, when after the Bayer picks and all these things, when it seemed pretty clear that things were not going to change right away, they decided to flee. It took about five years between the time that my family applied to, to, to leave to actually to the time that, that we were allowed to leave. During that time, I'm not exactly sure how we survived. To leave my hometown in the train was could perhaps be the most painful experience I had in my life, to live there. It was leaving behind family, friends, a sister, my brother-in-law, who, who, who I, I dearly loved him, and he came inside a train, he didn't come with us, and he had to leave, and we were trying to say goodbye to each other. We couldn't, you know, we were, you know, we were just crying so much. That it was impossible, so I still remember the gesture that he made, he said, sorry, sorry, I can't talk, you know, and he left. And then from there we went to, to, to the place called the Fishbowl, which is the, the place where they process you so you could leave the country and from where you would fly. And then from there we left in a taxi, my sister left behind, and I still remember looking back and, and seeing her, you know, waving at her. And, uh, you know, Kaha. As it, things turned out, I didn't see her again for another 18 years. Next thing that I know, we're, we're, we are going into the airplane to come to the U.S. And as soon as we got into the airplane and, and we took off, I, I just realized that the fear was lifted. You know, I, I no longer fear that something would happen to my mother, you know, or something would happen to me. And there, I, and there, and there, was, there was a period of, of, of euphoria. started to see some family members I had not seen in a long time. It was really, I would say, quite, you know, sort of a happy period for me because it was this, this small neighborhood that, that was basically being settled by Cuban immigrants and, and had, my aunt was next to us, my uncle was a couple of blocks down, my, aunt, my uncle, so it was like a big, you know, a big house, uh, the, the, the neighborhood, and I really, I really had a great time. But, well, you know, that was not going to last. You know, we were there for about seven, eight months, and then we left Miami. Of course, we, we, we came to the U.S. and we were not allowed to take anything. Not a guitar, not a set of strings, not anything. My teacher in Cuba told me when I came to Miami to go see his teacher. Uh, her name was Fela Gonzalez, and, and she was a well-known lady in the guitar circles in, in, in Havana. And Segovia, for example, stayed in her house when he would come to Cuba. So I went to see her. And now this, this grand lady was living in this small apartment in Miami. And, uh, and I played for her. And after I played, she came and she threw herself at my feet and she was kissing my hands. and. And, and I just couldn't believe what I, what I was seeing, you know, and, and, and my cousin, was, I just looked at him, we looked at each other like, you know, what is this? So, so she was very nice to me, and when she did, she, she, she set up at a gathering in somebody's house, 
So, uh, so, so people could hear me, and, 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 and one of the people that came was Juan Mercadal, one of the most famous Cuban guitarists, uh, who was the guitar teacher at the University of Miami. And Mercadal, he just basically took me in, and, and he taught me for the, all the time that I was in Miami, he never charged a cent. My father did not want to stay in Miami. He wanted to go up north to the New York area. He thought there were more possibilities for, for work. Apparently the family in Miami insisted so much that we stay there that they gave in and they stayed there. This is the way I understand it. Now what I also understood later, my father was told in Miami that, that, uh, that there would be no future for me as a guitarist in Miami and that if I was taken up north, um, that I would be, I think the words were that I would be known as one of the best players, you know, uh, one of the t top four players or something like that. I can only imagine how that may have sounded to my, to, to my family or, to, or to, my, to my father. The next thing I know, we were, we were, we were coming up north. I think the reason why my father chose Newark was because he already had a sister that was living there. And it was from there that he started looking for a job. What I remember going into Newark for the first time was not a good impression. We were greeted by somebody throwing a bottle at us in the car, and, and to be honest, and you know, I mean, I, I found I found the place depressing. At least the area where, where we were living. It, it was not easy. You know, I, I went to a couple of high schools. The last one being Arts High. I, I first went to a regular high school in Newark, and it seemed to me that the lunch hour meant you know, the Italian kids and the black kids wanted to kill each other. There were a lot of gangs in the area. It was a rough area. Okay, this is a high school that I went to for the uh, ninth and 10th grade. But I still didn't speak English well, and I struggled there. And, and one of the most difficult experiences was, for example, being asked to, to read Shakespeare out loud in an English class when I couldn't pronounce the things. I didn't know what I was saying. And, you know, having other kids, you know, sort of laugh at you. I hated living there. I, uh, I, I didn't have much support system, you know, when it came to the guitar. Obviously, I was very unhappy. The pressure of feeling that a lot of the reasons why we were there instead of in Miami was because of the guitar. So that's, I, told, I told my father, you know, if we are here because of the guitar, I'm not playing anymore. And that was really the decision that I made. It was a decision. I told him, if we're here because of that, I'm not playing. So I didn't play. When time came to, to go to college, and when, when, I, I, when I came, for example, to audition here uh, uh, at Peabody and, and Aaron Shearer talked to me and, and he basically was telling me, you know, that he wanted me to come here. I explained to him that I had not played the guitar for, for at least a year and a half or two years and I didn't know what would happen because, because I really didn't feel like playing. I just, I mean, and he said, well, it doesn't matter, you, you come. And, and what happened was that I won and I, I, I guess I, I became rebellious and, and or or maybe some things in me just came out. I want, I want, all I did was really basically party the whole time. And I didn't practice the guitar. It was, you know, I mean, I, I would do it maybe a half hour before the lessons or so, which frustrated, sure. You know, because he, I think his approach was, he, want, he was trying to get me enthused about it. And he, want, he wanted to have like two, three lessons a week. And, and he would talk to me about being a scholar and, and, and learning about the guitar. But it just, just my, my, I just was not into it. I, I, I wasn't. Shira was trying to sort of mold him and, and get him to do uh, a lot of things that he resisted doing. And he really resisted. And he did stop playing for long periods, mostly in the years before I got there. I feel that, that he was the right person for me. I mean, it was like walking into a wall, you know? I mean, people in my life had been telling me, you know, I should be a musician, I should do this and the other, but nobody was really giving me any, any, anything to work against, and he did. 
you know, so so whether it was by my doing some of the things that he's, he said or by rebelling against him that stimulated me to go ahead and find other ways to do things. By the time I got there, he was starting to find his own way. And, I, you know, he knew that graduation was in sight, and he was starting to realizing, realize that he was going to be his own guitarist pretty soon. So he was, at that point, starting to practice uh, pretty regularly. I came to realize that there was a wall between the guitar and me, and I, but I didn't know what that wall was. I couldn't understand. I didn't know what it was. But I decided I would pretend the wall wasn't there and I would begin to practice and try to, you know. And, and so I did. I, be, I began to practice, which is really painful. And I decided I would set some goals, you know, with the guitar and see what would happen. If they went well, I would continue. If not, I would just hang it up. And then his fourth year came along, which was the year that I showed up. And, and uh, things started to gather momentum. And there was already a buzz. You could feel it. I did the, uh, the Peabody Concerto competition in the school, you know, and, and I won. Uh, so I got to play with the Peabody Symphony, which was a scary moment for me. I did the, uh, the Concert Artist Guild in New York, and I won that. As a consequence of that, and my prize was to play my debut recital at Carnegie Recital Hall. That recital in New York was actually the third recital I had ever played in my life. I was still a student at Peabody. I didn't know how people were going to react. I didn't know how the guitar world was going to react to my, to my playing. There was a tremendous uh, uh, response to that concert and a very good review. And not long after that, he went and did the uh, Toronto International Guitar Competition. I remember this sort of wild looking guy with this humongous beard, bare feet, and sandals, jeans. I, I, so I, I can seem to remember my teacher, Oscar Gilia, coming out of the hall and saying, Boy, they said somebody just played Bach's second lute suite. Absolutely fantastic. And of course, that was Manuel. And Oscar hadn't heard him, and I hadn't heard him, but we knew there was this terrific uh, young talent um, who, was, who was participating in the contest. I guess, in a way, a, a snapshot of a number of people who were going to go on and do great things uh, for the guitar in the next, uh, you know, couple of decades. And he tied for second place. The, the first place winner was Sharon has been Manuel tied with David Leisner for second, and Elliot Fisk won third. It's a pretty good lineup. And so a lot of people were, uh, I think, upset about the, the result of, of the contest. There were many people who booed the decision and felt Manuel was the clear winner there. So with the Toronto competition, even though I, 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 I did not win the competition, the most important thing for me was that uh, the acceptance that I got from that. And uh, between the Concert Artist Guild and the Toronto competition, that's basically where I would say my, my, my career started, you know, and then from there on, you know, things began to happen. Growing up in New York, you think it turned him into a tough criminal, but actually it turned him into a really sweet person who happens to play the guitar better than anyone else, you know. Working with Manuel on La Folia was pretty easy because he sort of it triggered in him some kind of, of spark. Manuel brings you into the, the absolute realm of the imagination. The marvelous thing to hear the first notes played of your piece, and specifically if it's by somebody like Manuel. It was a wonderful sort of coincidence to write something for a player that handles uh, not only the phrasing, but also the ornamentation, the purity of Manuel's sound, and sort of the elegance that he has in, in performing this music. 
and the orchestra is absolutely stunning. So it couldn't have been any better for me in terms of a composer having this concerto played by an amazing player like Manuel is with Victor Pablo Perez, who is a wonderful Spanish conductor. Manuel also transformed himself when playing the instrument. I mean, it's very interesting to observe him because he, he becomes almost like, like an ethereal being. He's not one of these players who, who you would see almost like breaking the instrument. On the contrary, he's extremely powerful. Manuel's musical sensibilities are very much in tune with my own. Although I don't play the guitar, but when I listen to Manuel playing, to me that's, that's perfect, that's perfection. Something that is not even measurable. How do you measure when you go from one note to the next? That's something that is, that is done by instinct. And I think Manuel has that gift. If we uh, redid the, the website, I mean, we may want to move things around. Yeah. That's a very nice photograph. That, that, that's, that's you, you know? That's me? Yeah, that's you. Oh, my God. Yes, it is. Wow, lots of good photographs. And photographs with the tour coming up? Yeah. Whoa. What happened to... Why is my hair gray? <laughs> the slide. What did you do to the camera? <laughs> this... I like this one. It's very strong, you know, yeah. like... What began as, as me sort of helping him out with the things that he wanted to do in his career evolved into me basically overtaking the whole um, production. It looks like really, a, it looks like a kind photograph. You know? It goes from the little things to organizing his publicity, writing up contracts, answering emails that come in, taking care of uh, making sure that the website is updated. Yes. It's making sure that the machine runs smoothly. Not serious enough. This one is okay, and this one is better. Manuel got a call from Columbia Artist, who was then the, his manager here in the U.S., and they asked him if he wanted to, to be part of a, a commercial uh, for Lexus cars. He was already well known, for sure, but uh, you know, that certainly brings you to a public that you know, doesn't normally go hear classical guitar. I believe they showed one of those during the Super Bowl. So here I am in the back of the car, you know, 
plane and, and uh, it showed me really the amazing power of television, you know, to go play in the middle of nowhere. And they had seen you, they had seen you on television doing the commercial. Listen for it. It's the latest release on the Lexus label. We tend to run into David Russell here and there and Sergio and Odair in other places, but never sort of all of us together. When Sergio and Odair Assad and, and David Tannenbaum and David Russell, they were all here in Baltimore at the same time, uh, Manuel immediately wanted to have them all over. He goes through through long process of deciding which bottle to open. So, you know, if it should be a Bordeaux or, or, or a Spanish wine and in which order. He just loves having people over. He, he loves that. Manuel does not do so when we have people over here. He never ever plays the guitar. He just he doesn't do it. I I've been in parties with David Russell. He loves picking up the guitar and play a little bit. Manuel just doesn't. That's Brazilian. That's Brazilian. That? Sounds Argentinian. Huh? No, go on. Oh. We want to hear you, though. No, we want to hear you. No, we want to hear you. He was having a really, really good time, and, and um, he mentioned to me, you know, maybe we should sort of, you know, get a guitar and sort of see, pass it along. Well, you know, the guitar is is uh, is the catalyst. The guitar is the common denominator. So the guitar started to get passed around, and you know everybody knows some guitar party tricks. <laughs> well, and then wait, wait. You can always finish it off with. <laughs> And we ended up spontaneously with five people on one instrument. I don't know if that's ever happened before. Can we get can we get five people on one guitar? Yeah. I've seen people playing four, five, never. Five. We can try. So Manuel was holding the guitar. Sergio and Odaira Sad were behind him, and David Tannenbaum and David Russell, and they, here they were all playing one instrument. The whole issue of Cuba is very, very difficult for him. He has a lot of mixed feelings. He has a sister that lives there. He would love to go visit her, but he really cannot do it. He just can't do it. Can't do it. Here's a guy who hasn't been back to his homeland since the 60s. And he will not go there. And he could certainly go there, and he could go there and be welcomed. And, and he just, he won't move. His feelings are very raw and very real um, about what's going on there. When he believes in something, he really believes in it. I remember seeing a place that they call the Raft Museum in Key West, and you see these things in which you know Cubans try to, to leave the island. 
you don't throw yourself in, you know, in shark infested waters on one of those things unless you're desperate in search of their dreams. And I think it's, it's, it's really, as a Cuban, as a human being, it's just hard to see that. You know, it's hard to see that. It's hard to see why this, that's not necessary. People don't need to die that way. So I won't go back. I won't go back. I, I, cannot, I, can, I, I cannot go there and, and be seen in any way, shape or form that I'm in any way support that. When he did his Cuba recording, he decided that he wanted to dedicate the recording to those who tried to cross the strait to come to the U.S. and have died in the process. For me, it's, it's so heartfelt and it's so deep. Uh, it meant so much for him um, that it always makes my, you know, my voice go a little bit like that. It's as much of a closure as he can get without actually going to Cuba, to go to Miami and to be in that Cuban um, ambience. He has a lot of family down in Miami. We've, we've gone there. Uh, it's been very important for him. It's sort of like, it's like if he's reconnecting with something that was lost. Um, and I think as he gets older, it becomes more and more important to him. Oh, and now I understand. One of the most conflicting relationships for Manuel has been his relationship with Leo Brauert. And it just keeps, keeps getting more and more complicated, I think. Um, he grew up in Cuba adoring Leo Brauert, adoring him. And I remember being very impressed with, with, this, with this guy playing the guitar on, t on television, classical guitar. When I was nine, he was in my hometown, and there I was meeting him. You know, and, and, and I'm playing for him. Apparently, he, he thought I was talented, and, and uh, this guy goes on to, to become my, my, my idol. You know, he just... I mean, I, mean, I was sure that there, if there was a God, it would be second to him. One of the, the more painful experiences, I think, for Manuel has been lately when, when he read that Leo Brower had signed the letter in support of the Cuban government executing those, uh, those hijackers that tried to hijack this boat to come over to the U.S. Well, Brower is widely regarded as the greatest guitarist composer of our time, and I think that's right. So it's just so unfortunate. I mean, here's this little island, and it's produced two great artists, and uh, the political situation prohibits them from being celebrated together in a way. Manuel has talked to me quite a bit about the, uh, the situation there, and he said, you know, you don't know what it's like to not be able to leave. You don't know what the oppression is like. You don't know what it's like to not have freedom unless you've experienced it. And um, that's, that's a divide that will probably never be crossed, at least while the system remains in place and while Castro is still there. there there's something happened one time that was very powerful for me. And that is I was walking in the beach and, and, and there were some kids playing, and there was a bone. And, uh, and a kid, one of the kids made a comment about a bone maybe being a Cuban. And that was, for me, that was a very dramatic um, pointed out very dramatically the, 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 the drama of, 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 the, uh, of the Cuban situation, you know. His friend did a video tape of the walk that Manuel used to do from the conservatory in Santiago de Cuba to his home. He just took a video camera and he filmed a little bit in the conservatory. Then he walked to Manuel's house. Vivía Manuel Barruego. Unknowingly, he actually went into Manuel's bedroom and everything looked in ruins. The paint was peeling off the walls. There were holes in the ceiling. 
and it didn't look at all like, like the way it looked when he was living there. When Manuel's friend went back to the house uh, later, he was shocked to see that they had renovated the house. They had painted the walls, they had fixed the holes, and it was the only house in that area that actually had been, had been renovated, that had been fixed. And it seems to be that the only reason that they did that is because he had been there before to film, and he had told them that he was filming for Manuel Barrueco, who was a world-famous guitarist. And evidently, the, the government got wind of this, and they came in and they, they fixed it up. When I was in Spain with Manuel, and they were showing us this videotape, and I could just see the tears in his eyes and how he, he would love to go back if it is just to see these things, you know, because it has been cut. It's not there anymore for him, and he, and he can't, can't do it, at least not for now, maybe later. No. For the uh, Rodrigo recording with, with Placio Domingo, I, I, um... I really felt that, that, that we were speaking the same language. I felt a strong connection with him musically. Most of the people know the Aranjuez, the Concierto de Aranjuez, because of the second movement, which of course is the, the highlight of the piece. But as Manuel said, he wrote uh, really technically so fantastic for the guitar. He gives the possibilities for a great player, you know, to to really show the colors. The orchestration is simple, but so absolutely beautiful with the right atmosphere. Then, I mean, you cannot uh, help but just try to do the, you know, the best you can. So we don't know each other as musicians. We have a mutual admiration and I think uh, that it, it, it was great. You know, the, of course the notes are there. We are musicians, we can read the notes, but I think the interpretation, we came out to, into a understanding of each other and it was, it was absolutely beautiful. <laughs> At some point, um, Manuel decided that he wanted to sort of venture out of the classical guitar repertoire that he's been known to do. And he recorded the, the album some time ago. It's a kind of music that I was not so familiar with and, and it, opened, it opened new worlds for me. And I have to say, I've become a, a great fan of, of, of Chick Corea. It, it's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's beautiful music, very sensual, rhythmic. And I wanted to make it a recording of a variety of music of, from the US some time ago, which which turned out to be one of my favorite recordings that I ever, have ever made. And it was kind of a tribute to, to, to the U.S., you know, to my, my new country. A really interesting thing about that album is that when you listen to it, it sounds like this beautiful, very simple, very elegant thing. Of all the albums I ever recorded when I was at EMI, it's the one which most kind of is like the art which conceals art. Because there was so much work went into making it sound like it's totally beautiful and totally easy to listen to. So that, that was an eye opener. And that led later on to be able to do a uh, recording of duos with guitars that were not classical. And, and that, was, that was just amazing, you know, to work with people like Steve Morris, who's just an amazing player, you know, just a tremendous guitarist, and he's done so many things with his own group and, and with Deep Purple, and, you know, and, and just an amazing player. And with Andy Sommer, who's you know, a great musician, telling me about all the years of touring with the police, and I mean, what, you know, what fun that was. You know, I think Manuel making a record like this shows that he's open, and that's why he's such a great artist, that he will go out and take a chance like this. With two guitarists, 
you know, and I've done this a lot, obviously, you know, you, you quickly sense where the other guy is and how well he plays and where he feels time and, uh, you know, the, and then you, you start to kind of fit yourself together. But in Manuel's case, of course, he, he is a master. There's, a, you know, great uh, mastery of the language. So for me, it was sort of like, okay, well, I'm going to be riding in a Rolls Royce, so this is not going to be so, so this is going to be fairly painless and we're going to be able to get it together quite, quite fast because, yeah, this is uh, someone who can really do it. And, and that, that recording was uh, called Nylon and Steel and with Al Di Miola, who's, you know, just, just amazing player and, and with whom, you know, I've, I've gone on to, to, to do a number of, of concerts and, and tours. Playing with Manuel is great because he's, uh, he's, a, he's just very, very easy to, to uh, play with and change the music with and try things with. He's, he's very open. I think his world and my world coming together are not so far apart where it worked, but we had enough of individuality where uh, it, it, it made something uh, hopefully special for the audience. I like this record he made of, called Cuba. I know he's done a record of the Beatles stuff, uh, Lennon and McCartney, that was a great idea. I'd like to do the same myself. During that time that I stopped playing, I became a huge Beatles fan. I mean, I mean, I, I had I had already began to listen to some of it in Miami. Now in Cuba, that, that, that was prohibited. You know, if 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 they if they heard you playing like you know like Beatles, and they would come in and take the record. So I remember only twice over there hearing it, listening to it like softly. It's funny that years later I would end up making a recording of their music and that it would be done in London and it would be done at the Abbey Road Studios. So he told me about this Beatles project and um, he wanted to do three duos. My biggest memory was uh, this kind of overdrive that Manuel kicked into when things weren't going well. There was a particularly hard part that he had, and we hadn't nailed it. There was something that sort of came over him. We, we did another take, and he hadn't gotten it, and it was almost like you could feel it throughout the room, this kind of extra gear that he kicked into. And his playing kind of just elevated, and he just nailed this thing, like, you know, just perfectly in one take. One of the things I do remember about the Beatles album was that it brought up a very interesting um, you know, contrast in some ways a collision between the classical world and, and the popular music world. And I remember a lot of discussion, musical discussion, about what is the right way to play, um, play a melody. There's a big difference between classical recording and pop recording. And there was one very eerie, amazing, amazing moment. Probably impossible to describe, but I will try. Uh, we were recording uh, Penny Lane, and Simon Woods, he was telling us about playing behind the beat, and about the sound of the Abbey Road Studios. And then in the studio, he, he played Penny Lane with the Beatles. And we all sat there listening, standing in the spots where the Beatles were standing when they made it. And it was one of those transcendent moments. We all kind of looked at each other and just, you know, eyes aglow, just thinking about what these guys had done. It was. Extraordinary moment. In my teaching, I also feel very privileged to, to work with uh, some extremely talented students. And somebody like, like, like Wukash, I think is the most expressive and musical young player I have, have ever encountered, I think. Yeah, nice. When you go, pia, 
da pam da no da pam do di da di o da di o da pam di o da pam. You had to you had to get, get, take care of the colors mm-hmm. of those notes. I mean, I think the color of every note. To have somebody come and, and tell you, teach me. I mean, I take that very seriously, and, and I think it's very flattering. If you take your color and you work on your colors and you, you work on your vibrato, you work on your arpeggiation, the things, the final result will be better. <laughs> What if you didn't do this learn? Well, don't, don't change now. Nice. Nicer if you go. What I've learned from Manuel is uh, being a musician first. He really tries to teach you the way he does music, the way he approaches it. It's really looking at the bigger picture, trying to figure out, trying to bring out what's inside you, try to use your guitar as a medium to project these feelings that you have inside. It should move forward. I think, I think music has to move. After working with him, I, I really started to understand even better what is his goal when he's playing music. So you really get to, get to understand how is it that he does it? How is it that he works on the music? I'm just, I think for me this is a challenge to the imagination, how to do it, but I, I need to find, uh, for me it's important that I have an idea how, how I want to play everything. And sometimes in this kind of music it, it can be a challenge. Do you see what you have that there, that you subdivide in the phrasing? Yes. I will not do that. No, that's, Don't yeah, subdivide, that's, it's a whole I've one. I've never thought of it like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then now, <laughs> what? You're pretty intense. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. well no, that's, that's, okay. that's my job. This I'm is sorry. great. Uh, <laughs> and then what? We have the, this cello line. You know, and what I like is the vibrato in it. And also to make it mysterious, and to to me mysterious is, it means it's not going to be too. It's going to be a little bit unpredictable. So how do you don't go wait, and then you have this, and then this chord, and because hmm. I said you know at first many years ago I didn't know how to use colors, and for me the biggest influence was Takemitsu. You know, for, you know, it gave me an idea how to use colors with the guitar. For me, music, it's about feelings, you know, it's, it's about form. It's about traveling to different cultures, to different times, you know. But I think most of all, for me, it's just, it's just, it's just about what it's like to be human, what it feels like to be human. To me, that's, that's what music is about. When a musician is really honest in their music, you can hear it. You can hear it. There's an effect that happens, and that is that especially if it's a good musician, you don't hear a distinction between the music and the interpretation. When you hear a great interpretation, a great honest interpretation, the two things come together and it's one thing. It's just music, and it sounds improvised in the moment. I think honesty in, in music making is, uh, is very important. To me, honesty means when you play exactly the way you feel, when you don't exaggerate, when you don't understate what you're doing.
I need to know that this is coming from inside the player and this is what, what, what they feel. No more, no less. Even the physical part, you know, to, to watch a beautiful technique, to, to watch the, the discipline behind it, to feel the player, to uh, sense their, their imagination, to hear the music. There's, there's, there's a lot of beauty in it if, if, you know, if we make the effort to find it. Hopefully, go into a, into a concert situation and to remind people of feelings that, that maybe they've forgotten about, maybe they're too busy. You know, hopefully that's what a concert can do. And to take our emotional clothes off in front of the people, for us to show ourselves can make us vulnerable in a way. But in a world, you know, that, that it seems to deny feelings in a way, to try, to try to get away from them, you know, our job is just the opposite. Our, our, our job is to, to go in there and keep them alive and to bring them out. But there are some days where, where it just everything is working right, you know, and everything seems, seems magical. And it's, it's like, you know, you're in the zone and, and fingers are moving well and the feelings are right. And, 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 and that's just a great feeling. And then you, and then you feel like you're, you are, you know, you're on top of the world, you know, and if I'm playing in a concert and I happen to, to be having a great day and, and it's, it's a beautiful hall with beautiful sound and, and a great audience and playing beautiful music, I mean, when those things happen, it's just, it just, it makes it all worthwhile. Thank you. 